Good evening and welcome to Larry's Wake. All rise, please. Really? Yes. <laughs> this is a reading from the Holy Libel, entitled The Bard's Prayer. Great fodder and art in heaven, literature be, my, be thy middle name. To cord and come, thy quiche be done, and await thou as it is in heaven. Give not this day more daily burgers, but give us our bus passes that we may transport ourselves unto heaven. <laughs> and lead us not into chapters, but deliver us from evil by priority courier or registered express post as long as a letter carrier gets the job. <laughs> For theirs is a corporate kingdom, the power without glory. Why ever would we go there? <laughs> Amen? You may be seated. Amen. The Bard's Prayer was written by Steve Lennon, poet and letter carrier. <laughs> and he regrets he can't be here tonight, but... Yes... <clears throat> Yes, we saw the big box looming like a twister in the east. It was promising to drown us with its down and dirty feast of discount, of discounted chapters by a deep Ferrari priest and Starbucks muddy brew. Larry's party is no longer Larry's party is no longer, Larry's party is no longer, he's a big box kid gone wrong. <coughs> but we fortified our spirits with a cup of heaven's best and a bottle of McNally's ale imported from the west, and we brought our bought our books from heaven and from Tim without a rest and we rained on Larry's due. Larry's party is no longer. Larry's party is no longer. Larry's party is no longer. He's a big box kid gone wrong. Okay, everybody. Larry's party is no longer Larry's party is no longer Larry's party is no longer he's a big box kid gone wrong thank you so this is called an open letter to people who buy books we love books and not much else Books, we figure, are the only thing the word, that the word sacred can apply to in our age, and despite the info highway hype, books still have a huge potential to affect people's lives, and therefore the world. We know this, that from experience, and so do you. Of course, in these times of unbridled greed and the deification of markets, books are treated like disposable razors rather than essential tools for change. Take, for example, the assault on small bookstores and publishers. A chapter store moves into the neighborhood. They hire some poor but good-looking university students, part-time of course, and set up a computer to order their books. Thousands and thousands of books. Bad go books, good books, obscure books, everything. Meanwhile, some small struggling publishing house has just published a book on, say, the history of firecrackers. They love firecrackers and it's a really good book. Print run of a thousand or so. I forget it. I 
Chapters Warehouse, warehouse orders a whole bunch. <laughs> warehouse. <laughs> like 500. The publishers are ecstatic and start to work on the next book they will do on the history of insect repellents when they get the check from all the chapter stores. Now, there's still a small independent bookstore down the street where the owner works 60 hours a week and knows every customer by name. <laughs> One of them, Fred, is obsessed by firecrackers, goes to firecracker conventions, discussion groups, etc. Fred asks the owner if he could please special order two copies of the new History of Firecrackers books for him, one to read and one to keep in an airtight plastic bag. <laughs> the owner makes the or order, and the distributor sends him a back order notice. All the available books are, cha are at chapters. Small daily defeats like this one eventually drives the owner to close the store and get a job as a telemarketer. <laughs> That's not going to happen. <laughs> A few months later, Chapters returns 497 History of Firecrackers books to the distributor. The workers at the small publishing house, which could have been selling the books during this time, file for bankruptcy and wander the streets in a drunken haze, setting off entire packs of black cats and spend the night in jail. Fred, our thoughtful customer, reads the reviews of the books he covets in the Firecracker Weekly newsletter and sighs. With all the small independent bookstores destroyed, the computer at Chapters decides to just start ordering Stephen King and self-help books. The city council reads the self-help books, which instruct them to run their lives and therefore their city like a business. Libraries close like car doors. The moral of this story is, well, fuck Chapters and all like it, including the pseudo-independent saviors. If a bookstore's stock does not reflect care, thought, taste, and pure irresponsible whims. If its stock is ordered by a computer only to please the broadest possible consu consumer demographics, then it's not a bookstore, it's just a, some big room full of books. They can keep dropping these rooms from the sky until the end of the world, but they can't make you shop there or drink their stupid coffee. <laughs> As Tom Waits recently said, it's getting harder and harder to find a bad cup of coffee these days. Support your small, independent bookstores and publishers. Do it for yourself and do it for your community. Thank you. Literary details? I don't, uh, take up too much of your time. Um, the only other, only other song I could think to play, uh, it's sort of about a tyrannical corporation that, um, my family was involved with. At least uh, my grandfather was back in the day. Um, this is a song about a company store uh, that uh, was run by the company my grandfather worked for. He was a miner in Cape Breton back in the uh, early part of the century. He mined since, uh, well, I guess he was nine years old when he started, and uh, he finished when he was about 65, and he died shortly after. But uh, my father told me all the stories about uh, him taking part in lots of different uh, things, like he was in the labor choir and you know he's uh, part of the union and kind of things together and he ended up uh, at one point well a lot of different times actually uh, a lot of the people would get together mostly like the uh, frustrated uh, workers and they'd go and burn down a company store there's usually one or two in the in the uh, communities surrounded these mines <laughs> I don't think there's any books back then though they didn't want them reading anything so there was never any books then but if there was books, they were probably filled with, uh, you know, the, the uh, corporate sponsoring uh, mine type books. But at any rate, so this song I wrote is uh, it's sort of a true story based on a lot of stories that I heard as a kid about a company store. <laughs> Headed for the 
the company store I'll watch my children starve no more tonight I'm gonna feed them I haven't worked in 40 days For 23 I've had no pay In a week I'll have no place to stay And now they'll have to kill me And now they'll have to kill me man in Sydney mines. I told Big Johnny of my plight. His voice grew loud with anger. Today's as good a day to die as any that'll come to mind. I haven't home a sickly wife and I haven't worked since Easter. We hadn't worked since Easter. Half the town will die for the miner never calls. And the other half will leave when the mine decides to close. And the people who are left will starve to death at the hands of the company store. Bring the army in on us when the union gets too close to them. Burn it down, boys. Burn it down, boys. Burn it down, I said to the head. We'll shoot us down like our fathers, but like them, we're we'll only getting down. the cold road through the town, the story of we'll burn it down, we'll burn it to a cinder. As I spoke these words before my eyes, their doors and windows open wide. Ten more miners join my side, beaten, starved, and angered. They're beaten, starved, and angered. But half the town will die for the miner never told. And the other half will leave when the mine decides to close. And the people who are left will starve to death at the hands of the company store. Shoot us down like our fathers when the union gets too close to them. Burn it down, boys. Burn it down, boys. Burn it down, I said to the head. They'll shoot us down like our mothers, but like them, we're already getting down. My children starve no more tonight. I'm going to feed them. I haven't worked in 40 days. For 23, I've had no pain. In a week, I'll have no place to stay. And now they'll have to kill me. And now they'll have to kill me. seems the average authors are not above avarice, constantly reworking the either orality of their moralities. They toss their codified ethos to the ether to anesthetize their earlier theories on ethics, selling and reselling their bodies of words to the highest bidder. Is it any wonder that to publish or prostitute is rendered in Latin by the same root word? And the public is the loyal John queuing up, taking its cues and T's from sundry and advanced publicity of a bookstore so much better for being bigger. The public loves a good read, but not as much as a good brawl, a brouhaha, having been specifically bred for the purposes of such circuses, for the pomp of circumstance. Chapters strives to capture the percolating per capitalist market build its empire by kicking the little guy in the hypogastric regions, 
using the pubescence of publicity to stunt his growth. Don't get drawn into the utter shellishness of this battle of the books with no account. It could end swiftly in detestamental defeat to greed rather than in an agreement for all to succeed. The final five-line whimper of a thought to end this franchise-free association chain of disjointed thoughts, thriving on the controversy over being so damned universal, chapters should be read as verses. Quilt that inspired it all. Bruce Woods tribute to Alias Brace by Margaret Atwood. Yes, we're enjoying a beautiful quilt show this December. I'm going to disappear into Spring Breezes by Rose Campbell. Also, in the show we have works by Marge Giesbrecht. This one by Marge was picked up by Evelyn Yock on the very first night. And we have some lovely work by Heather Campbell Entz. This one called Star Upon Star, an original design by Heather. It's an amazing layering of stars and colors. Heather also did this small piece called Indonesian Landscape. And then along this wall were four more pieces by Ruth Wood. This book coat for the well-dressed book. It's a lovely uh, book cover. You can slip the book in. It has a bookmark in it and the handle. Carry your favorite book wherever you go. A piece called Jack. Bruce's uh, little kit. Go and sew. Fully loaded with needles and thread and scissors. And this piece uh, that she uh, did... Good morning, Gary. Good morning. My Chris. first, uh, you know, visitor of the day this lovely Saturday morning. You look chilled. I'm frozen. <laughs> I'm typically frozen. <laughs> You've only walked two blocks. I've only walked two blocks, but it feels like 20. <laughs> well, welcome here. Getting back to the quilts, uh, over in this little corner we have a couple small ones. One's called Clee by Heather Campbell Entz, and the other one's Squares by Rose. And here in the front room we have two more small quilts. Uh, the one on the left is called Pinwheel by Heather. And that sold on opening night. And we had an event here in the store with readings. Celebration party for the quilt show. And the one on the right by Rose called Cafe Latte. This one by Marge. And this wreath by Rose. So there you have it, quilt show for December 1998. No rants for me, I just uh, want to remind us all here that this is also the uh, fourth birthday party. We were, we're remembering that, right? Four years! I'm so proud of you, my bro, that you've actually survived four years here. I mean, that's a, quite a coup to have a place open for four years here on Corden Avenue. So, happy birthday, happy fourth birthday, and uh, congratulations. One haiku for you. On the second floor, drinking wine, reading a book, the place is heaven. <laughs>